Five ways you don't realize movies are controlling your brain. So there was a mass shooting during a Batman movie, and goddammit, it turned out the killer owned a Batman mask and called himself the Joker. By now, several, many, many talking heads have come to the conclusion that the movie somehow triggered the massacre or whatever. You know the game at this point. Sadly, we've seen this whole cycle play out more than once. As always, this knee-jerk reaction by old, scared talking heads will predictably result in most of our audience scoffing and saying that movies can't influence people to do anything because movies are make-believe and even non-crazy members of the audience know how to separate fact from fiction. Well, thing is, that's equally wrong, but not for the reason the talking heads think. Point number five. No, you can't separate fact from fiction. You've seen Braveheart, right? You know, it's based on a historical event. The movie makes it clear that Mel Gibson's character, William Wallace, was a real guy who lived in Scotland back in the horse and castle days. You know that Hollywood spiced up things for the movie. The real Wallace probably never assassinated a dude and then jumped off his horse off a of, jumped his horse off a balcony in slow motion. So if you don't mind, just quick me, you know, tell me the parts that were fiction without looking it up. Like the evil king they were fighting, was he a real historical figure too? What about Wallace's palooka friend Hamish or the crazy Irish sidekicks? Were those real guys? That part where Mel Gibson's main ally, Robert the Bruce, betrayed him and sided with the English in that big battle, a.k.a. the turning point of the entire story. Did that really happen? What about that bit at the end where Wallace has sex with that princess, revealing that the future king of England would actually be Mel Gibson's son? That's the most historically important thing in the whole film. Surely that was true, right? But you don't know, do you? And who cares, right? It's not like that impacts your life at all. It's just historical trivia, okay? Now, consider this. After Jaws hit theaters, we nearly drove sharks to extinction with feverish hunting to the point that their populations may never recover. Every single person who saw that movie knew it was fiction and that those characters were just actors. They probably knew that in real life there isn't a shark big enough to eat your boat. But when the genius scientist character in the movie agreed that killing the shark was the only way to prevent dead tourists, we assumed that part was true. The same as we assumed you could really blow up an oxygen tank by shooting it. So we all killed the sharks based on what the make-believe movie told us. Oh, but you know, that's just one oddball isolated incident. Oh, did you know that after Top Gun, Navy, Aviator, recruitment skyrocketed by as much as 500 fucking percent? Or that the number of kids taking martial arts classes exploded after the Karate Kid. Or that the popularity of the CSI TV shows has resulted in a glut of students going into forensic science. Or that we could cite examples of this until you hit your monthly bandwidth cap. How many of you left Fight Club thinking you knew how to make napalm? Which of us haven't forced a baby to do that wanking motion after watching The Hangover? I know what some of you are saying. So what? Because some gullible people do what movies tell them, that means a Batman movie made that guy shoot up the theater? So I suppose watching Bridesmaids will all start us shitting in sinks? No. You're intentionally reaching for examples where it doesn't happen and ignoring all the ones where it does. Even if some movie straight up told you to become a mass murderer, it'd be working against a lifetime of society pounding the opposite message into your brain. The point of this article isn't to pin violence on movies. The point is that it's much bigger than that because, point number four, stories were invented to control you. This isn't some paranoid conspiracy theory. It's a fundamental part of how human culture came about. Ask yourself, why do we go watch superhero movies? After all, variations of these stories about brave superhero human heroes predate recorded history. We used to tell them around campfires before written language existed. They were created as a way to teach you how to behave. Thousands of years ago, when your ancestors were living in tribes and hunting gazelles, nobody knew how to read. Even if they could, paper wasn't a thing. Parchment was rare and precious. They had no written historical records. They had no educational system that could devote years to teaching history to the kids. This was a problem. Once humans started forming civilizations, the guys in charge didn't just need the next generation of kids to know how to fish and hunt, they needed citizens who would fall in line and fight for the tribe. That meant the kids needed to understand the big picture, why preserving the tribe is important, why we hate that tribe across the river, and why our tribe is better than them, and why it's important to go off and fight in the next war no matter how scared you are. Now to do this, they could either A, bore the kids to death with years-long recounting the history of the tribe, which nobody has probably written down anyway, or B, 
tell him a cool story. They could tell the thrilling tale of Kolgar, the Valiant, who, when the evil neighboring tribe came to slay all the women and kids, stood alone and fought bravely through the night with four arrows in his chest until the enemy retreated in terror. You want to be like Kolgar, don't you, little one? Otherwise, he will have died in vain. Clearly, B is the one that's going to stick in the kid's brain. It doesn't matter that the story's either fiction or grossly exaggerated. It gets the job done. It makes the kid conform to the kind of citizen the tribe needs him to be. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. Your tribe may very well be better than the one across the river. Your real history is probably full of heroes whose sacrifices were just as important as, if less romantic than, Kolgar the Valiants. The tribe didn't go with the fictional version because they were liars. They went with it because it was the only way for the truth to survive. So while we use the word myth these days to mean a lie that needs to be debunked, often the myths were simply more efficient versions of the truth. They're easier to remember, they don't take as long to tell, and they eliminate a lot of the messy ambiguities that can confuse the point, and also, they won't bore the listener to tears. The point is, this is why stories were invented. To shape your brain in a certain way. A guy named Joseph Campbell wrote whole books about it, and we should read them. These basic stories, these myths of the hero overcoming the odds, the great man who sacrifices himself for the greater good, they're what make civilization go. In a society, the people and the buildings and the roads are the hardware. Mythology is the software. And while your ancestors had their heroes that they heard about around the campfire, you have Batman and Luke Skywalker and Harry Potter. And yes, the movies you watched this summer serve the same purpose as those ancient myths. Sometimes this is super obvious. Clearly, Rocky IV and Day After Tomorrow are trying to cram a message into your brain with the subtlety of a sweatpant erection. But what's the message behind James Bond or Iron Man? There isn't one? That literally isn't possible. Because you see, number three, the writer of a story always has an agenda. So, quiz time. What do these hugely popular hero characters all have in common? Batman, Spider-Man, Superman, Luke Skywalker, Frodo, Harry Potter, Finn from Adventure Time. They're all orphans. It's kind of weird, right? You think that's a random choice? Do you think the writer just flipped a coin? Or do you think there's an emotional button being pushed? The writer reaching around the logical part of your brain and triggering something inside you without you knowing it. That sounds devious, but those little subconscious tricks are fiction writing 101. We covered a bunch of them in the past with links for you. It's a scary power to entrust someone with, if you think about it, especially if you, as the audience, don't pay close attention to what they're doing. You leave the theater a different person than you were when you came in. It's a difference in millimeters, sure, but you're going to watch a thousand hours of this stuff in the course of a year. It builds up. What, so, okay, you're trying to tell me there's some hidden agenda behind the Transformers movie? It's freaking robots punching each other. No, there is no intentional hidden agenda. Maybe a little. But there is certainly a set of assumptions that the filmmakers are passing on to you. In the case of Transformers, the assumption is that combat is beautiful and exciting, that military hardware is sexy, that destruction is gorgeous and fun and completely free of consequence. And most importantly, the solution to all conflict is to be more masculine, powerful, aggressive, confident, and destructive than the bad guys. But the people already think that. These movies are just giving us what we want. Right. But why do you want that? You think he came out of the womb thinking military hardware was cool? If you grew up in a real war zone and didn't have movies and TV, would you have the same opinion? I'm not saying Michael Bay is a secret tool of the military-industrial complex trying to brainwash you into supporting the next war. <clears throat> no more than the makers of Jaws were trying to wipe out sharks. They were just trying to make a scary movie, and Michael Bay is just a dude who likes explosions. It doesn't matter why the message is there. It soaks into your brain either way. This is what everyone misses when debating this stuff. One side says, Hollywood's trying to brainwash you. And the other side says, Michael Bay isn't smart enough to brainwash an armadillo. And they're both missing the point. This is why when some people point out how racist the Lord of the Rings stories are, like orcs are evil by virtue of being born orcs, dwarfs are greedy because they're dwarfs, Aragorn is heroic due to his blood, it's both correct and unfair. It's correct because, yes, that's the way Tolkien's universe is set up. 
Nobody in the stories hesitate to make sweeping generalizations about a race, and they're always proven white right when they do. Frodo's magical sword didn't glow in the presence of enemies, it glowed in the presence of a certain race of enemies. Go write a movie about a hero with a gun that glows in the presence of Arabs and see what happens. But it's also unfair, because Tolkien clearly didn't sit down and think, I'm going to increase the net weight of racism in the world in order to firmly establish white dominance, and I'll do it with elves. He was just writing what he knew. Of course, a guy born in 1892 assumed that Nordic races were evolved and graceful, that certain other races were born savages, and that midgets loved axes. Hell, he could have been the least racist person he knew, and he'd still be the equivalent of a Klansman today. Whether or not the agenda was intentional is utterly irrelevant. We can't emphasize this enough. There is no conspiracy. Yeah, you'll occasionally have a movie like Act of Valor that is transparently intended to boost military recruitment, but 99% of the time the movie's agenda is nothing more than a lot of creative people passing along their own psychological hang-ups, prejudices, superstitions, ignorance, and fetishes, either intentionally or unintentionally. But they're still passed on to you. Because that's what stories are designed to do. Michael Bay feels a certain way about women and about the role of women in the world, and you'll leave his movie agreeing with him just a little bit more than when you came in. Knowing that, it's even scarier to consider that number two, you were raised and educated by pop culture. Quick quiz, if you get arrested by the cops, how many phone calls are you legally allowed? One, right? I want my one phone call. Somewhere there's a suspect saying that exact phrase to his arresting officer right now. He may even in insist it's in the Constitution. And this is when the cop has to explain that it's an urban legend, and that he'd probably know that if he read Cracked more. This criminal and you only believe the one phone call rule because you saw it in movies and cop shows. In fact, pretty much everything you know about the criminal justice system came from actors on a glowing rectangular screen. Have you ever been called for jury duty? Do you sit through the morning training session where they have to carefully explain that real trials are not like TV shows? That's why movies are so effective at shaping your personality, because you subconsciously assumed that large parts of these fictional stories weren't fiction. Sure, you knew True Lies was a silly Schwarzenegger action movie, and you knew that in real life nobody could really ramp a dirt bike off a Washington, D.C. skyscraper. But you didn't know that the city doesn't have skyscrapers at all. Even though the movie was fiction, you didn't doubt that part because you had no reason to. Now, take this one step further and think about how many other aspects of your life you've only experienced via Hollywood. If you're from a rural area... How do you know what it's like to live in the city, or vice versa? If you've never been to Paris, what does your mental image of it come from? Some hearing and reading this very article love Sopranos because of its depiction of the mob was so much more realistic than all those stylized movies that came before it. How do you know it's realistic? What are you comparing it to? All those real mobsters who came to your house at Thanksgiving? The reality is that vast piles of facts that you have crammed into your brain basement were picked up from pop culture, and for the most part, you don't realize that's where the information came from. This is called source amnesia. You know that giraffes sleep standing up, but you've long forgotten whether you heard that fact in a school or in a tour at the zoo or saw it in a cartoon. Either way, you'll treat that fact as true until something comes along to counter it. This is the entire reason Mythbusters is still in the air. Okay, so who cares if gas tanks don't really explode when you shoot them? So what if a lot of your interesting party trivia isn't accurate? What, you don't think the same principle goes for the important stuff? When you were on your first date, you had a picture in your mind of what that should look like. How both of you should behave, what type of activities couples do together, which one of you should pay, etc. Where did that picture come from? Did you take a dating class in elementary school? Did your parents sit you down and tell you? Bullshit. You saw it in a TV show or a cartoon a solid decade before you were even old enough to drive. If your parents were poor, where did you get the idea of how rich people live? Where do you get your concept of what success looks like? How successful people dress? What they drive? How they decorate their apartment? Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood. The only reason you've heard of Armani Suits is because the 1980 movie American Gigolo launched the brand. The reason you think smoking is cool is because you've seen it a thousand times by a thousand handsome, smooth, leading men smoking cigarettes. In other words, 
Fictional stories shaped your entire world. You'll instinctively reject this idea because you hate the thought that anyone but you has made you who you are, but every single point of data will prove you wrong. Bullshit, I just watch movies and TV for fun. It's escapism. It lets me turn off my brain and relax while things explode beside and behind Samuel L. Jackson. Right, but why does that relax you? Why have you been trained to feel a release of stress when you see a bad guy explode? Why do you prefer that world over your own? Let's put it another way. Escapism and fantasy are fun because they let us leave this boring old world and go to a world that we would prefer to live in. And we're defined as people by those fantasies. After all, we will spend our whole lives trying to make the real world look like fantasy. Science fiction came first, space travel came later. Mythology still drives us and defines us. Now stop and ask yourself who we've entrusted to write it for us. Which brings us to the heart of this whole matter. The number one point. Everything in your brain is a story. Let's ask this. Why was it so easy to rally Americans around the idea of winning World War II to the point that we were willing to ration and sacrifice and send an entire generation off to war? when it's so hard to get us worked up about other things like curing cancer or global warming. We'll come back to that in a second. So knowing the history of stories and all the stuff that we've talked about, it makes sense that our brains are built to try and process everything we see as a story. We want all our information packaged this way. It's the way data has been fed to us for the last thousand generations. It's how we've been absorbing it since the first time our parents read us a bedtime story. And every story needs to have two elements a defined set of good guys and bad guys, and a neat structure with a beginning, middle, and end. The fact that we need everything fed to us like this and have trouble getting interested in a situation without it actually makes solving some problems almost impossible. For instance, the answer to the question above is that we cared about World War II because it was a story. It had villains, Hitler and Nazis. It had heroes, the Allies. It had a distinct beginning, middle, and end. Cancer doesn't have any of that. There's no one guy we can blame for cancer, and winning the war against it actually is a series of tiny incremental advances that may never result in victory. Global warming is even worse because there it looks like the villain is us. So as a society, our entire process for figuring out and solving problems involves clumsily trying to make a story out of them. When we follow a complicated subject like politics, we need that distinct hero and villain. So we'll ignore the shortcomings of our guy and amplify the shittiness of the other guy to make them fit in that mold. When we hear about a war, it's almost impossible to think of it in terms of multiple factions all asking in self-interest. We need one side we can root for, usually under the guise of the underdog young rebels overthrowing the evil old empire, like the Arab Spring. Likewise, we lose interest if our news story doesn't have a clear beginning, middle, and end. In the biz, they call that the narrative bias. Are American troops still in Afghanistan? How, how's that going? Do we even know? When's the last time we've checked? We're all on board for the first act of the story, 9-11. And the second act, the military goes in and deposes the Taliban. But then the third act, the troops come home to victory parades and everything's back to normal, never came. So we just kind of forgot about it. So here's the key. The innate urge to shoehorn every single piece of information into a story format is very well known to the people who run political campaigns or write advertisements or cover news stories. So when there is a crisis, they know you need a bad guy. No problem can simply be the result of a flawed system or a bunch of factors that are nobody's fault or, God forbid, the result of anything we did. We're just the audience. No, there has to be a villain we can pin it on. That's why, to this day, we're still trying to figure out who caused the economic collapses if we'll find a cabal of a dozen shady bankers in a room who made off with all our money, rather than a flawed system that millions of investors and consumers drove into the ditch because of a steadfast refusal to think five minutes into the future. Look at the last few wars again. We can't get past the idea that terrorism will end if we just blow the shit out of the bad guys. Why? Because that's the way it works in the movies. In Star Wars, when the Emperor died, all evil died with him. The same with Sauron and Voldemort. If we kill, imprison all the drug kingpins, all the drugs will go away, right, guys? You can find this in your personal life. If something goes wrong in the office, somebody has to get blamed. Everyone goes into ass cover mode because they know the bosses will need a villain in their story. 
When he takes on some personal project, new job, losing weight, you expect the same three-act structure that you'd see in a movie. See your problem, take it on, experience your darkest moment, eventual triumph. And you get depressed when that doesn't happen. That triumph part often never shows up. Why are people so obsessed with the apocalypse? Because every story has an ending. And the idea that the human story can just drag on forever, aimlessly, never progressing toward any particular goal is just unimaginable. We can't process it. And our expectations of what these real-world stories should look like, and what they look like, and how they should play out, are programmed into us by pop culture. So yes, for the fucking love of God, movies matter, TV shows matter, novels matter, they shape the lens through which you see the world. The very fact that you don't think they matter, that even right now you're still resisting the idea is what makes all of this so dangerous to you. You watch movies so you can turn off your brain and let your guard down, but while your guard is down, you're letting them jack directly into that part of your brain that creates mythology. If you think about it, it's an awesome responsibility on the part of the storyteller. And you're comfortable handing that responsibility over to Michael Bay? Just something to keep in mind, that's all. Five ways you don't realize movies are controlling your brain. That is a fantastic piece of work from David Wong, senior editor of Cracked.com. And I think it was really only worth reading in its entirety. <laughs> 